Good afternoon, everybody. It is Wednesday, the 5th of January. Uh, thanks for being here. Today, as you know, we have a guest speaker, Jeff Tarrant. Jeff uh, has worked very closely with uh, neuromeditation. Many of you may be familiar with his work with neuromeditation. He's been at some of the conferences doing that. And of course, we added his meditation protocols to the New Mind software, and you can get trained in that with him. But today, he's going to be focusing on the use of ketamine assisted psychotherapy and neurofeedback. Jeff's out there in Oregon um, and been doing some really great work. So I'm not going to spend more of my time introducing him. He'll give you some background on himself. Uh, we're going to go till about 10 to the hour and then we'll take questions and answers. So Jeff, thanks again so much for being here with us and uh, starting our new year off with a great presentation and it's all yours. Oh, cool. Cool. Thanks, Rob. Uh, thanks, Richard. Nice to, nice to sort of virtually be with everybody here. Um, and so, yeah, those of you that know me um, know that I, I tend to over, um, uh, I, I prepare too much material and that has happened again today. So uh, I'm going to, I'm going to kind of move through this uh, at, at a decent pace to make sure I cover as much as possible. May have to bump over a few slides as we move along. We'll see. Um, but before we um, jump into the material itself, I just wanted to give a quick background for those of you that don't know me, but but even if you do know me, you know, kind of how I'm connected into sort of the um, psychedelic space um, and working with ketamine. And so the first thing I want to say is um, I'm actually still pretty new into the ketamine world, and there's actually people on this call that are have way more experience than I do. Um, and so I wanted this talk to be sort of an introduction to this topic and to start to explore some of the ways that uh, ketamine is being used right now and what we're starting to see in terms of how it might integrate really well with additional therapies, um, particularly neurofeedback, um, because of course that's our group. So my background, I'm a psychologist. Um, I've been working in the neurofeedback world for quite a while, um, since the late 90s. Um, what I've been up to lately is directing the Neuromeditation Institute in uh, Eugene, Oregon. So combining neurofeedback with meditation. But then the other part that's probably more relevant to this topic, um, I've, uh, I'm a cleric in a uh, peyote church here in Oregon. And so that's how I got involved with uh, kind of working with different psychedelic medicines with other individuals. So in that capacity, it sort of allowed me to be able to do that in a legal way, um, but obviously um, sort of outside of a clinical setting. So a little bit different. Um, I've also had some additional training. So there's a, a group in Boulder, Colorado, uh, Medicinal Mindfulness that uh, has a whole course on working with cannabis in more of a psychedelic uh, way. It's actually really powerful. Um, so I've done that training. I'm currently involved in a two-year uh, augmented psychotherapy training with uh, the Mind Institute in uh, Germany, which is uh, psychedelic th therapies incorporated with other types of therapies. And then some of you may know here in Oregon, we passed uh, Measure 109 uh, a couple of years ago, or maybe it was just last year, uh, to legalize psilocybin services. And so um, in the next year or so, they'll start taking applications for people to be able to offer those services legally here in the state of Oregon. So kind of moving toward that. Now, none of that has anything to do with ketamine directly, uh, but then that's another area that I've just recently started working with is uh, working with a physician nearby who uh, has kind of opened a ketamine clinic. And so I've become involved with working with him. So in the course of the talk today, I want to talk about a few different models um, that are starting to emerge. So sort of the traditional model of uh, working with ketamine as a, a treatment for things like uh, treatment resistant depression, OCD, things of that nature, but then also where this seems to be going and uh, how the way that ketamine is being used is starting to be expanded into some really creative and I think really powerful ways. So, you know, somebody just sent me this article literally like the other day, you see the date on it, December 29th, 21. So this is, you know, all of a week old in the New York New Yorker. Uh, ketamine therapy is going mainstream. Are we ready? Um, 
Uh, maybe. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know how to answer that question. Uh, we're getting ready. Let's put it that way, I think. Um, and one of the interesting things about this article is, of course, you know, they're telling somebody's story in this article. And, you know, the, the, the one woman that they were kind of talking to who was getting ketamine therapy didn't have a particularly great experience. And uh, I thought that was interesting that they sort of highlighted that. And it actually gets to a, a big piece of our topic today in our conversation because there are things that we can do uh, supporting people who are getting ketamine therapy uh, to make the experience more productive, help them prepare for it, help them integrate it in a way that is much more likely to have therapeutic benefit. So that's kind of where this is going. All right, so let's start at the beginning, right? Because we probably have a wide range of people uh, with a wide range of backgrounds. So what what is ketamine, uh, right? You know, I think most people say it's a horse tranquilizer. It's like, well, you know, uh, there's more to it than just that. So it was originally developed, uh, it was first synthesized in 1962, and then it was approved by the FDA in 1970 as an anesthetic. Uh, and, you know, and sort of made popular by Park Davis. And um, it was actually used by the US military during the Vietnam War. Um, and, you know, it's a little bit different than other anesthetics in that it does not generally, uh, you know, I mean, in a high enough dose, that's that's a different thing, but it doesn't extinguish consciousness. But what it does is it creates this dissociation uh, of mind from body. And so both from my own experience um, uh, with ketamine, but also with clients that I've worked with, this seems to be a very consistent experience particularly when you get into uh, certain dose ranges of where people feel um, like they're leaving their body or disconnected from their body um, or like they don't have a body at all, which is I think what mo most people I've worked with kind of relate to that sensation that you just don't even have a body. And even that by itself can be really powerful of having a moment where you are not connected to your pain. You're separated from that. Um, so, uh, actually I think it was the guy that created ketamine, his, his wife, if I'm remembering the story correctly, came up with the, the idea for calling it a dissociative anesthetic. And that's kind of stuck. And I think it, I think, I like it. I, th I think that term kind of makes sense because it really does distinguish, um, some of what is experienced with ketamine that's a little bit different than certain other psychedelics. Um, I am not a medical doctor, um, and most of this is is over my head on this slide. This is above my pay grade, but um, I know some of you will be interested in this. So, you know, what are the pharmacological effects? And you can see there's a lot. There's a lot going on here. So uh, many times you'll hear, you know, people referring to this as a, um, you know, an, an NMDA antagonist. And that can lead to a variety of effects, right? So some of those dissociative hallucinogenic effects, if you want to call it that, uh, anesthetic, neuroprotective, anticonvulsant, there's a lot going on there. Stimulation of sigma and D2 receptors, some more hallucinogenic effects. It increases BDNF. So I think probably everybody in this call will be very familiar with that. This seems to be pretty consistent with a lot of psychedelics that, uh, sort of creates this opportunity, this neuroplasticity, the brain is more flexible. And again, this is gonna come up for us down, uh, further down this conversation because I think there's some really significant implications for us as neurofeedback providers. If we've got the brain in this very receptive, flexible state, how can we take advantage of that? Uh, you, you see activation of the, um, uh, mu opioid receptors, so analgesic and anxiolytic effects, uh, et cetera. So a uh, combination of those last two that we've got there may be partially what's leading to these strong antidepressant effects. There's People are still trying to figure this out. Um, there's a lot of research being done in this area of looking like why, why does ketamine seem to 
uh, work really well, especially with things like treatment resistant depression um, and reducing suicidal ideation. And you know, of course, they've they tend to get focused on the the pharmacology. What is it about this substance that that has the effect, right? Um, and so that's interesting. And there is some research. I'm not going to linger on this page, but this is just one of those research articles showing the uh, increase of BDNF and then some related brain changes that happen uh, shortly after a um, uh, administration of ketamine. So, you know, this has been looked at. It's one of those exciting areas. Um, when ketamine is used in this way, right, sort of as a pharmacological agent uh, for depression in particular, it's most commonly dosed at, it, this, is, this is kind of the language that's usually used with this, is, you know, sort of milligrams to kilogram. What's the ratio of the dose? And when you kind of look through things and you talk to different folks, it seems like the most common dosage is about 0.5 milligrams to kilogram, but there's a wide range. Um, and I know that some people will even go above one milligram to kilogram. Um, you know, but in general, this is kind of what you're looking at. The most common common route of administration is IV. Again, this kind of came out of a medicalized, well, I mean, it is. I mean, you, you have to go through a physician to, to work with this medicine. But so the most common route of administration is IV. And, uh, and so the dosing can be kind of spread out a bit, right, over the course of time. Um, what's interesting about ketamine is uh, it, it appears to be effective kind of whatever the route of administration. If you can get it in the body, uh, then it seems to work. Uh, of course, the onset of the effects and things like that vary how long the session lasts are gonna vary a bit. Um, in general, you know, the sessions are relatively short. Um, you know, once you're administered the ketamine, if it is an IV or an IM administration, it comes on rather quickly, um, you know, within minutes. If it's oral, it's gonna take a little bit longer. Um, but then the session itself, you know, when you are kind of in that ketamine state is, you know, really, it depends, but you know, 45 minutes to an hour and a half, let's say. So it's relatively contained, which is another kind of nice thing about uh, about this experience for some people, because um, obviously with other psychedelic medicines, sometimes the sessions are very long, right? So with psilocybin, it might be six hours ish. Um, you know, with LSD, it might be you know 12 hours. So that's a very long time to be sort of in this state working um, in a therapeutic way. So this is much more contained. Uh, the other thing that you see is that the dosing can be repeated, um, you know, once every few days, you know, again, this seems to be all over the board of kind of what people are doing with this. And some of it is uh, obviously client, patient dependent, you know, administering a dose, seeing what the response is, and then kind of making an assessment based on that, uh, when would be a good time to do another session. Um, what I've been seeing kind of lately is that, um, you know, once a week, this is the guy that I work with, um, he tends to do sort of a weekly uh, ketamine uh, administration with, I'd say the average person usually has about three. Um, I've seen people who have had way more than that, you know, eight, nine sessions. And I've seen people who have had one. And we'll get to that in a minute too, of why, you know, some things to consider in terms of um, spreading those doses out and what you might be doing in between. Um, I've also seen too that sometimes, you know, with multiple administrations, the dosing is gonna get modified. So based on the person's reaction to the initial experience, you might go up a little bit, you might go down a little bit, kind of helping find that sweet spot. So we've been kind of talking about that um, ketamine seems to be uh, particularly effective for treatment resistant depression. And, you know, again, the research tends to kind of look at this 
really is like a medicine, right? Where you take your medicine and you feel better. And so like even some of the research like this one that uh, the first bullet point here. So, you know, uh, a single dose, five milligrams per kilogram, uh, induces rapid and robust antidepressant effects in severely depressed patients. That's great, that's amazing. So there was a 50% on average reduction in depression scores um, with a pretty high response rate, you know, so 71 to 79%, you know, after 24 hours. That's amazing, actually, right? When you think about that, treatment-resistant depression, how difficult that is to get any kind of movement at all. And if you've got, you know, two-thirds of people, uh, you know, having a positive response, up to three-quarters, and they're reducing their depression symptoms by 50%, that's pretty miraculous in some in some ways. It's also really useful for uh, suicidal ideation. So again, they see this other study, 81% uh, of patients were uh, free of suicide ideation after 24 hours. Now, here's the caveats that I've got at the bottom. In general, what you see is when people do respond, uh, those effects don't always last. Sometimes they do. Um, my experience in talking with other providers is that it doesn't seem to last. It seems to diminish. Um, and again, this is actually fairly consistent with other psychedelics. You see sort of a big positive response initially right after the experience, and then that tends to kind of fade over time. Uh, there was another sort of point that was brought up by um, uh, one of my colleagues who's on the call with us here, Debbie Elliott, that there's other research showing that, you know, up to 30% of people are non-responsive. So, you know, this isn't sort of like a magic bullet necessarily. It's kind of the points I'm making with the, the asterisks. Not everybody has this big positive response. And even if they do have a big positive response, it may diminish, um, you know, in some cases fairly quickly. And so, again, this sort of starts leading us toward, well, what can we do to facilitate, kind of make this more effective? So, so far, we've just been kind of talking about ketamine as this drug, right? Like, let's give you this drug and it's gonna make you feel better. Um, but of course, there's this whole psychedelic element to the ketamine experience, which is uh, significant. And so there have been, you know, people looking at this for years and identified at least four kind of distinct non-ordinary states of consciousness um, depending on the degree of this dissociation from mind and body, as well as the degree of ego dissolution. So it varies. Um, and it seems to be influenced by the obvious things, the dose, the set, the setting. Uh, those all seem to influence the kind of experience that somebody has. So I'm not gonna go through all of, uh, all of these in great detail, but, um, you can see these are the four kind of generic states. Obviously, this doesn't cover everything, but you can see that you know when you start moving up above 0.5 milligrams to kilograms, you start getting into these categories of things like out-of-body experience, near-death experience, ego-dissolving, transcendental experience, um, and you know when you kind of read some of these, so um, you know the out-of-body complete separation from one's body, significantly diminished ego defenses, visit to mythological realms of consciousness, encounters with non-terrestrial beings, et cetera, et cetera. So you can have a, a, a pretty dramatic psychedelic experience um, you know, with ketamine. So we already mentioned just a second ago that yeah, dose is important and set and setting are important. So, you know, maybe I need to change the title of, uh, of this slide because uh, of course it matters. And you actually see that even in, uh, even in some of the research, we're starting to see this, that they're, they're identifying this. So uh, there was a study done um, looking at the effectiveness of ketamine with treatment resistant depression. And uh, what they saw was that there were enhanced benefits from people who had big psychedelic experiences. So this is interesting because from sort of a medical perspective, the way the field at least was initially, 
was trying to figure out how can we get rid of the psychedelic experiences? How can we just use this as a medicine? You take it, you feel better, but then you don't have these terrible side effects of a psychedelic or mystical experience. And it's starting to turn out that those psychedelic and mystical experiences may be more important than the pharmacological effects. Um, so you see that kind of in the next bullet, right? In other psychedelic research, uh, so uh, Griffiths, who's a big name in, in psychedelic research, mystical experience during psilocybin sessions is associated with greater treatment outcomes. Um, and then, you know, Sullivan down at the bottom, profound psychological experiences, regardless of specific medicine, so whether it's ketamine or psilocybin or whatever, may improve mental health and overall well-being. So there's more and more evidence being gathered that the type of experience you have and what you do with that experience may be actually more important than what the medicine is doing. Of course, they go together, right? So like, how can we kind of take advantage of both? Again, because of time, I'm not gonna get into huge details on these next couple of studies, but just to show you that there are research studies looking at this idea of mystical experiences with ketamine and showing that uh, that those are important, right? So in this case, they were um, comparing a ketamine infusion to um, a benzodiazepine sedative. So that was kind of the control condition. So they randomized people into getting one or the other. Uh, during the second week of a five-week therapy program for uh, for alcoholics. And what they found is that the ketamine led to a greater mystical and dissociative effects compared to the control. Not a big shock there. But this was interesting. The mystical experiences, but not the dissociative experiences, mediated the effects of ketamine on drinking behavior. So the people that got the ketamine infusion uh, had less cravings, they engaged in less risky behaviors following that experience compared to the control group. And this was mediated by the degree of the mystical experience. You see it here as well with cocaine uh, dependent adults. Now this is a very small sample, um, but I like that they kind of provided this little chart where you see how people responded to um, a questionnaire about uh, mystical experiences um, whether they had uh, a lorazepam, ketamine at sort of a lower dose and ketamine at a little bit of a higher dose. And you can see that the dose makes a difference, right? So, you know, if you look at, uh, you know, the first one, I had an experience in which I realized the unity of all things. Well, there's a very clear uh, progression from the highest dose of ketamine to the next to lorazepam. Uh, and that seems to be true with almost all of these um, uh, items. Now, again, they found a very similar thing to that alcoholic study that we just looked at. The mystical experience, but not dissociation, mediated their motivation to quit cocaine 24 hours after the infusion. So these are just a couple of studies, but they're pointing us in this direction, right? Um, that has been highlighted recently in some articles. So, um, uh, Yadens and Griffiths, so this is a recent article, they kind of put forth this argument that the subjective effects of psychedelics uh, are necessary for their enduring benefit. So you might get that short benefit, but for those to really stick, the psychedelic experiences, the mystical experiences are actually necessary um, and may account for the majority of the benefit. And then, you know, other people have looked at this and they've controlled uh, for the drug effect. So when the intensity of the drug effect is controlled for, there are certain subjective effects that predict therapeutic outcomes. And those are not just mystical experiences, but also uh, insight or belief change occurring as a result of the experience. So when people have big insights about themselves, about them lives, about their lives, or they've changed some fundamental beliefs that have been limiting them or getting in the way, uh, those are the things that seem to lead to more prolonged positive outcomes. And so again, leading us finally to the point of like, well, what can we do to facilitate this? 
if, if there's more to it than just the medicine, then we have a role. <laughs> there's somewhere for us to fit into this. And so uh, this came from an article by uh, Robin Carhart Harris, another um, you know heavy hitter in the psychedelic research space. And you know, really kind of looking at this idea of an extra pharmacological model, what what conditions around the medicine are important to facilitate better long-term outcomes. And so really what you're kind of looking at here is that the psychedelic experience is influenced by a specific psychological and emotional states of the client. So something about the client, how they're coming into it, makes a difference. Right, so the set where where they are with themselves and their attitude and their beliefs and whatever make a difference. So they found that positive experiences, positive psychedelic experiences, are associated with characteristics like absorption, openness, acceptance, surrender. So if you can enter that psychedelic space in a way where you're allowing the experience to happen you're open to it, you move toward it, you allow it, you don't resist, you're gonna have a much more positive experience. And of course, anybody who's worked with psychedelics in any capacity kind of knows that, right? Um, you know, so the instructions are often say yes, uh, say yes to the experience, move with it. Negative experiences are associated with low openness, low surrender, and or high preoccupation, apprehension, and confusion. And uh, I mentioned my friend Debbie um, a few minutes ago, we were talking about this the other day, and what both of us have observed is that people who come in uh, and are interested in working with ketamine, if they have really rigid structures, if they're sort of obsessively anxious, uh, if they're super defended, they don't necessarily have the same kinds of outcomes. Uh, and I've noticed this it, it, with a few clients in very dramatic ways that the ketamine didn't seem to have hardly any impact because they were so defended. And it took a lot of work to help them become, to loosen their defenses, at which point the ketamine all of a sudden seemed to work. Um, and again, I don't think this is just me. I think this is something that we're starting to see pretty consistently. It kind of gets us to um, another model. This is from Robin Carhart Harris, again, who proposed this entropic uh, brain hypothesis that we the mind tends to move between uh, states of entropy, right? Where things are more chaotic or less chaotic. And uh, his hypothesis that he sort of like laid out is that when people are overly rigid, the system is rigid, it's locked down, those are low entropy states, it's a rigid state, and it's associated actually with a variety of problematic conditions. You can see them over there in blue, right? And it's interesting because he's got things listed like depression and OCD and addictions, rigid narrow thinking, a lot of the things we're talking about right now are characterized by this low entropy state. And so, the idea is that if we can introduce entropy, if we can loosen the structure up, create some flexibility, then there's an opportunity for something different to happen. So this is where the medicine comes in really handy, shifting the person over into this high entropy state. So again, the question is, are there things that we can do as providers to facilitate that, to help shift people into a little bit more of a flexible state. And we do this all the time. So you can see where this is going. You're probably already going like, oh yeah, totally, this is what I do. Exactly, so if we take what we do in terms of thinking about creating psychological and cognitive flexibility, and then applying that to somebody's work with ketamine. So they end up starting to work together very nicely. So you're starting to hear more and more about kind of, uh, ketamine therapy is ketamine assisted therapy which is a little bit of a broader way of thinking about it so again some clinics are, are are using ketamine where you go to the clinic the doc hooks you up 
you get your infusion you know when you're done then somebody picks you up you, you don't want to be driving afterwards somebody picks you up and takes you home and that's kind of it um there's not really much preparation there's not really much integration and there's a lot of that going on and as we've kind of seen and suggested with some of the other research that's that's going to you know it's going to provide some positive results um, but it may be limited so with ketamine assisted therapy we're really expanding this model and including preparation and integration on either side of the psychedelic session so for preparation what we're doing is we are working to create the best set and setting possible to maximize the beneficial potential so we know a lot about what is going to facilitate a a positive experience so how can we help the client get into the right mindset now some of this is going to be through coaching talk therapy things like that right um, but there's other things that we can do integration is going to be sort of after the experience so these are non-medicine approaches that assist them in prolonging or deepening the improvements making sense out of the experience figuring out if if you if you've had insights or belief changes how do you incorporate that into your life right how do we take advantage of the flexibility so there's a lot of preparation tasks we're not going to spend a lot of time on this but i just wanted to kind of make the point that if you're working in this kind of model this uh ketamine assisted therapy model there's actually a fair amount that you need to do with a client before the ketamine session to really help them be in the right mental state for the experience even some of these things that seem really basic you know establishing trust and rapport discussing fears and concerns if somebody is really anxious about a, a ketamine experience that's going to influence how open they are to what happens now in a moment we're going to start getting into how we can incorporate uh, neurofeedback and neuro meditation into this process so on a real basic level you know how could we use neurofeedback well neurofeedback increases neural flexibility right i mean and you know we have a lot of experts in this conversation you know so i'll be curious to hear what other people think but from my perspective um having been doing this in in this field for a long time i feel like some of the most beneficial things that we get from neurofeedback is flexibility it's not necessarily pushing this thing down or making this thing go up, but creating flexibility uh, in the brain so that it's not stuck in a certain pattern. Great. Uh, reducing obsessiveness and or fear. We've got lots of protocols that can help with that. So if we have clients who are coming in and that's part of their uh, therapeutic treatment plan, right? helping them to work on that prior to a ketamine session is likely to help them get more benefit from the experience and then there's this idea of state awareness right a lot of clients don't really have a whole lot of insight in fact particularly people who might have a trauma history going inside going internal is super threatening and scary and might be avoided at all costs so how can we help them to start going inside and becoming more aware of these different states and learning how to be comfortable with these different internal states and then use that to their advantage so this is where mindfulness also comes in right there's a there's a, a nice overlap between what we can do with neurofeedback and what we can do with mindfulness and meditation training and you're starting to see uh research coming out showing that meditation mindfulness in the context of psychedelics is actually very beneficial so again because of time i'm not going to linger here but you see that very first bullet point compared to non-meditators receiving the same dose meditators indicated higher ratings of blissfulness spiritual experience and feelings of unity as well as lower anxiety around ego dissolution so this was in the context of a psilocybin uh, journey so again, helping people become more aware of their states, learning how to navigate that, be comfortable being in their body, being comfortable with their feelings, 
recognizing what's happening internally. And this is also where neuro meditation comes in handy. So we've got five different meditation styles that we use with neurofeedback. And so I've just got them listed here with some of the characteristics of what might be happening uh, where we can use that to our advantage. Okay, so now is the uh, experiential part of the webinar. Um, so we'll have our psychedelic experience. Just kidding. Uh, but so we talked a little bit about preparation, then they have some sort of psychedelic experience. And then what happens afterwards? Well, uh, it's interesting because there's a lot that happens in the psychedelic experience with ketamine that, again, works to our advantage. So there's increased neuroplasticity, right? We've increased entropy, right? Uh, there's a higher learning rate. So you're able to learn more. You've got this flexible state where you can take in new information that maybe you couldn't before. So because we have these this increased flexibility and uh, ability to be more aware of ourselves, this is a, a golden opportunity for us to work with them with continuing with neurofeedback, with meditation, with other strategies to build on what they just experienced, what they just, um, some of the gains they just had. So this is a model that is starting to become more common where you actually have your preparation, there's a psychedelic session, you do integration, and then you do more preparation, and then there's another psychedelic session. And you kind of loop there for a while. So that the, the ketamine session uh, is being kind of sandwiched between therapeutic sessions. Uh, and in the work that I'm doing and in the work that Debbie's doing in particular, that includes neurofeedback. And then at some point you're kind of you're kind of done. You're where you need to be. And so then you, you kind of wrap it up. So we can also use uh, these processes, neurofeedback and neuromeditation, to kind of help people remember the felt sense of what it was like in that state. If you can reconnect to that feeling uh, of peacefulness, of relaxation, of heart opening, of equilibrium. So again, can we use neurofeedback or neuromeditation to help them stay connected? So I want to show you a couple of brain maps here and a couple of processes that are that are different to kind of uh, highlight some of this. So I mentioned that I'm still pretty new to a lot of working with ketamine in particular. And the physician that I work with, um, this is how the process works, is they go to him for uh, an intake. I don't even know, see the person yet. So he makes sure that they're appropriate and then says, okay, I, I want you to do a preparation session with a therapist. And I'm one of their choices. So they contact me. We do some preparation, kind of like we discussed. Usually not doing any neurofeedback at that point, although sometimes we do. Usually do a brain map. Then they do their ketamine session, and then they come back to work with me, in which case we're usually doing neurofeedback or neuromeditation. And then they do that sort of cycle process. They go back and do ketamine with him. They come and see me, and we do follow-up work. So that's one model. And Jeff, just to give you a heads up, it's a quarter till the hour. That's that's too bad. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> I'm, I'm talking as fast as I can. Um, uh, yeah, and you know, if we don't get to Q&A right away, we may be able to go over a few minutes, but go ahead. Okay. <laughs> so um, a real quick case example. So this is somebody recently working with a um, <clears throat> really bright uh, woman in her 40s. Uh, been struggling with depression, serious depression, for years, and has on and off suicidal ideation. Um, on the Beck depression inventory, her score when she came in was 42, which is very high. She's been on lots of meds. She's been in therapy. She's done a TMS. Nothing, there was only one time where there was some med, and now I'm not going to remember which one it was, seemed to help for a little while until it didn't. So this is kind of one of those cases where, you know, you really want to try to work with this person. You know, is there anything that could help? And uh, her first ketamine session, so it was IM, 
and uh, 0.9 milligrams per kilogram, pretty decent dose. She reported having an out-of-body experience. There was a kaleidoscope of colors. And then she said that was all great. But then when she started to return to her body, right? So you're in this place where you kind of forget that you exist. And that's great. But then she said, as soon as she started feeling like she was returning, she became really intensely aware of the pain that she was coming back to. So the sadness and the pain and like didn't want to come back. And so it was actually like really sad for her that she had to come back to this and felt kind of trapped in this. So with the integration, of course, we're talking about this, we're exploring this, and then kind of working with the neuro meditation to try to help her. Can you learn to kind of move into this idea of spaciousness? Can you allow it to kind of expand a little bit without kind of contracting things as soon as you return, right? So learning to navigate those internal states with a little bit more skill, skill building. So a week later, she did another ketamine session. She had a pretty similar experience, but this time was a little more comfortable. Uh, she was less sad upon re-entry, uh, but she also noticed that she was trying too hard. Uh, so in the session itself, she was trying to make things happen instead of kind of moving with the flow, right? So again, listening to those themes, it gives you something to work with, right? It's like, oh, okay, you're trying too hard. Can we work with neurofeedback, with neuromeditation on non-efforting? allowing the process to happen itself. Again, think about most of the instructions we give people with neurofeedback. You know, we, we kind of encourage them to not try too hard. And when they do try too hard, it usually doesn't work. This is her pre and post brain map after uh, before she began. And then after the second, 24 hours after her second session, you can see that high beta uh, cleaned up really nicely, especially, um, well, in the amplitude, but also in the coherence. Uh, here's her Beck depression inventory scores after, so this was after, before, and then after two, um, after her second and third dose of ketamine, you can see there's a nice downward trend. Um, however, even at, at, after the third session, she was still, you know, in the moderate depression range. Um, this is one of those people that was had a lot of defenses, and it took a lot to kind of get her to open toward this. What was interesting is that after about seven or eight sessions, she came in and had this new awareness that some of her old history hadn't been resolved, some old trauma history. And so this was kind of the opening point. As soon as she recognized that and acknowledged it and started working with it, and she continued with the ketamine and the neurofeedback, but her scores, well, we didn't actually do more testing, but her mood improved dramatically um, and appears to have stuck. So interesting, right? Another model, so this is uh, Ann Bethune is a, uh, a colleague in Kansas City, Missouri. And so uh, she's a social worker. She gets referrals straight to her. She doesn't intake then sends them to a physician that she works with. They prescribe a, uh, a, a you know, a lozenge that the client picks up, brings back to her. They have the session together. So it's a four or five hour session with preparation, the oral ketamine and integration all happening in that four or five hour time frame. And then she refers out for other services. So if they need neurofeedback or acupuncture or whatever, she refers out. So it's a little bit of a different model. And then uh, Debbie's model at the Wellwise Boulder Clinic in Colorado, I personally, I think this is the way to go. I think this is the way that, that things should, should be moving. So clients get referred straight to, to Debbie. She does an intake, gets an assessment by a physician. You gotta have a physician, make sure that they're appropriate. They prescribe the lozenge. So similar to what Ann was doing. Um, but then Debbie kind of expands the process, right? So that there might be multiple preparation sessions, right? Maybe it's one, could be five, could be more, right? It depends on the individual, but you've got that flexibility. Then the person is doing the ketamine session there with Debbie in a supportive environment, right? So that four to five hour kind of time block. And then you're doing lots of integration there with Debbie as follow-ups. 
So art therapy, talk therapy, neurofeedback, et cetera, meditation, training, repeating that process. This is a much more, in my mind, supportive container for this kind of work that's gonna allow um, some pretty amazing changes. So here's a pre-post brain map that Debbie provided of somebody with PTSD and a traumatic brain injury. So you see the before, this was three days prior to uh, beginning uh, ketamine assisted therapy. And then you see the post two days after. So it's interesting, uh, kind of similar to the one that I showed that high beta dropping dramatically. Again, you can imagine the uh, opportunity that provides. Two more quick things and then we'll get to a couple of questions. Another thing that that uh, I think Debbie's do doing that's really amazing, uh, this is a, a picture of her space, by the way, um, is that you can, you know, the way that we tend to use ketamine is the way I'm describing. People go into this deep dive, uh, they're having their experience, and then when they come out, you process. You can also use it in lower doses uh, as a psycholytic therapy so that the person is still able to have a conversation material comes up they're able to talk about what's happening to work on their issues in this more open state um so you know really powerful really amazing and in fact uh you could even do neurofeedback while the person is in this um you know kind of low dose ketamine state very cool so uh there's a there's debbie's uh a retreat center clinic there in Boulder, Colorado. So I put this information up because her and I are gonna be offering a four day uh, experience over the summer. We're still working on dates, probably be in June for treatment providers, neurofeedback folks uh, in particular to come out and have a four day experience of uh, experiencing ketamine. Again, if you're appropriate and you pass medical screens and all that kind of thing. Um, but the, also in conjunction with learning how to use this with clients, with neurofeedback and that sort of thing. So if you're interested in learning more about that, once we get the details, contact one of us and we'll 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 provide you some more info. Uh, also wanted to bring up that I'm going to be presenting a, a half day workshop with Heather Hargraves at the upcoming AAPB conference, uh, integrating bio and neurofeedback in psychedelic assisted therapies. So if you're going to AAPB, maybe you can come find us there too. Okay, I'm stopping. All right, well, we're at about six minutes to the hour, five minutes to the hour now, Jeff, beautiful. So Richard will unmute folks. That'll take a minute or so, and um, then we'll get into some Q&A for you. All right. <laughs> so you, you, did, you did well, you did well. I suppose it that is. That's absolutely fascinating information, just fascinating. I'm going to want to watch this again. And for people that ask that are in attendance here, yeah, we do post this up on the YouTube channel for New Mind. Uh, should be up hopefully by uh, the end of this week or Monday next week at the latest. It depends on the staff there. Just want to make sure everything looks good before we post it. All right. Questions, folks. I think we're getting folks unmuted now. Jeff, uh, where would you put ayahuasca in the uh, panoply of psychedelics? Um, hang on here. I'm trying to figure out how I can see you guys. Uh, you can't. You won't I be can't. able to see. They, they, oh, okay. We just see you. You're full screen and you can't see us. We're all, we're all hidden. <laughs> um, that makes sense. Um, so um, can you say more? Like, what do, what do you mean exactly in terms of... Um, are you talking about just you know where do I see kind of ayahuasca falling in terms of a um, a therapeutic uh, medicine? Yes, please. Yeah, I mean absolutely, right? But um, but but it's the same issue, I think, right? Is that the set and setting the context, what happens before and after? Um, I think this is true with all of the psychedelic medicines, as far as I can see, right? Is that um, you know, I, I've known lots of people who have done many, 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 many ayahuasca journeys. And when you see them immediately afterwards, they're glowing, right? Literally, there's there's white light beaming off of them, right? They're like at peace, they're happy, they're clear. And then you see them two weeks later and they're back to doing the exact same stupid stuff they were doing before. Um, and so 
I don't know how many times I've seen this happen, right? And so it's like somehow they're not taking the lessons and making it part of their real life. It's like they have a big experience and then that it's kind of over. And so for me, this is where I think the work from a therapeutic standpoint is really important is how do we help people um, take it beyond just the experience and make it part of their daily life? Thank you very much. Um, hello. Oh, wow. One of the best LSD related uh, presentation. And I thank you so, so much. And I can tell from your discussion, your passion and your own experience into that not ordinary state is the jewel that you can share with us. And I realized, uh, first of all, my name is Hannah. I've been doing on and off ayahuasca for over 40 sessions. And I went to stay with Shaman for two months to do that. And when you mentioned about setting a set, it's so, so, so important. When you also mentioned about brain state, it's a state. When you're talking about people after uh, failing to reintegrate into the real life after the LSD, it's a brain state. They are still stuck into the old state. State change when they have to, must go through a uh, psycho, ego, ego kind of a disintegration. Uh, I remember quite a few years ago, Rob's son had a brain state shifting after he used something like that. And he mentioned, Rob was asking all of us, but I didn't say because I don't want to throw people off the loop at that time. He had a brain state, and I had, which is the brain feels like an electric shock. Sometimes heart will go through that. So, and I think the therapist um, must go through that we ourselves in order to know what brain state they are in <coughs> instead of pushing them. You mentioned about patients should not push them. That is so important. But as a therapist, if we do not push them, if we push them, their chakra will open prematurely. It will cause it will cause panic. At that time they cannot control their body, they go into panic. It will cause tremendous high of a blood pressure or in the, um, or, or the very low shock. So it is something that I highly, highly suggest. Training, training, go through 30, minimum 30 to 60 sessions yourself before touch your patient. That's the only thing I want to say. Yeah, yeah, thank you. And so I'm gonna, let me follow up on a, on a couple of points you made. So uh, I agree with you that I, I think it's really important um, if you're gonna be working with, um, even in an adjunct fashion with, uh, with these medicines, it, it is really critical, I think, that you experience it yourself and you kind of know what's, what can happen and occur because otherwise you're going off of what you've read and that is not sufficient um, you know, um, to really understand. And so getting appropriate training um, is you know, training and experience, right? Having experience, but then also getting appropriate training um, for how to work with these medicines or work with people with these medicines, I think is really, uh, really critical. Your other point that you brought up um, in terms of working with clients, uh, I think we can make things much safer by doing things in a context like I was describing uh, Debbie's process, where you're working with this person over extended time periods, three, five, six months, a year, whatever, where you're you're doing a variety of therapies in conjunction with the uh, the medicine work, um, to me that's the ideal because of the safety uh, element. You, you're you know you're not forcing anything and you don't have to rush anything. You've got time to kind of let the process emerge. Beautifully said, beautifully said. And another book that I think I've written by Ram Das and also Tibetan Book of the Dead, gone through very, very accurate uh, state change. So, and um, that might be something very good textbook for students to learn, especially therapists to learn how they're going through these state change. Yeah, great. Yeah, and I would say um, uh, that just that uh, as far back as the 60s, before it was outlawed, um, most of the therapists who were using LSD uh, uh, and psilocybin mentioned the exact effect you're talking about. If people 
do it, they can't sustain it. You, just one thing doesn't sustain it. But what would happen in LSD unsupervised is people would start to have really negative experiences. After eight or 10 sessions, they'd take too high a dose of what's street stuff, and then um, they'd stop doing it. And then, so they'd gradually drift back to their original state. And this goes along with the lines, you know, of traditional teaching of uh, yamas and niyamas uh, that, you know, like Hatha Yoga is a preparation for meditation. It's not a thing, well, it's never meant to be a thing in itself. It's in the West we've done that. But um, preparation, in all my meditation workshops for the last 20 years, I've talked about that too, that you have to prepare the person. They have to, um, uh, in a very sophisticated fashion, for the experience. And the experience is not the end in itself. It's the, tr it's the opening up, as you said, the receptivity, the openness to creativity, to receptivity, um, and that's the other side of uh, non-attachment. Uh, and, and and that learning to cultivate that once you've been opened up is where we, our, our journey begins with them, you know, as uh, neuromeditation teachers or psychotherapists, we're helping them remain open and develop that, that receptivity, don't you think? Totally. Yeah. It's a, I, Richard, we should have just had you done that. You could have done it in four minutes instead of me taking, you know, 50. No, no, no. This, this was just fantastic. The details. I love it, Jeff. It was an excellent, excellent presentation. One of the best I've seen. So I'd love Excellent. to have you back on it more and love to get Debbie on it too. Yeah. And uh, maybe we can get Naveen uh, if he's interested and, and they can discuss other sides of it too because this is going to be one of the major features of therapy moving forward in the 21st century there's no doubt about it yeah so jeff think about getting together with those folks debbie and others and and and, and instead of doing a formal presentation maybe putting together a few slides as an opening and then an open discussion with the yeah, three of you right. and this team here would be lovely so think about that and if debbie's here debbie think about that as well with uh jeff yeah, that'd be great. Uh, I, I'm going to speak for Debbie and say, yeah, she'll do it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, we'll be in touch down the road with you. You know, we'll give you a little bit of break from this one. But uh, we're, we're going to see people starting to, you know, peel off now because they're going back to clients. But, yep. you know, thank you so much. Great information. And no, I mean, the details and the history make it where people can build a foundation of knowledge. And you did a beautiful job doing that for everybody. So we really appreciate it. Thanks. Great job. It was great, great to be job. with you. Great job. Yeah, thanks. If, Thank if you, you guys so have, much. Thanks. If you guys have follow-up questions or whatever, feel free to get in contact, and I'll, um, you know, I'll, I'll try to be responsive. Uh, so thanks, guys. Have a great rest of your okay. day. Thanks. Take care. Bye, bye, Jeff. Bye, bye. Bye, Thank everybody. You. Thank you so much for doing this. I really appreciate it. Run. Um,